Bora da pao, I hope you're all okay. Before we start reading chapter three of our book, I just wanted to say a massive well done on the work you've been doing lately and submitting it to me has been absolutely great. I've really enjoyed seeing all the work you've done, all the pictures you've drawn, coloured in. It's, it's been excellent, guys, so well done, honestly. Keep it up, okay? Right, chapter three um, of our book is called Faceless Fiends. In case you didn't know what fiends means, um, it means some sort of demon or evil spirit, okay? Right, here we go. Alfred limped down the corridor, steadying himself on the sideboard to catch his breath. Quite a few paces ahead, the royal guard's cloak fluttered as they bustled the boy's mother along. Alfred tried to speed up, but in doing so, he stumbled over a rug and twisted his ankle. Ouch! With no chance of catching up with him, he thought of Richard the Lionheart and called out, I, 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 I com command you, you to stop. Not only was Alfred out of breath, but he was not used to giving orders. As a result, the words came out a little wonky. Despite Alfred being royal and these being the royal guards, the pair of faceless fiends ignored him. The queen turned her head and shouted back to her son, Oh, please, Alfred, I don't want you to see this. There was a look of terror in her eyes, a look the boy had never seen before. His mother had always been a wonder of pretending everything was tickety-boo when it clearly wasn't. She would always make up stories to cover what was really going on. The sound of the explosion in the middle of the night was nothing more than a thunderstorm. She would then stroke off his head until he drifted back off to sleep. After his grandmother had mysteriously gone missing one night from the palace, mother would make believe that Grammy had written postcards to him. She was the old queen, his father's widowed mother and much loved by the boy. Alfred always called her Grammy because when he was little, he couldn't say Granny. His mother would read the postcards aloud to him as she put him to bed at night. Here's one postcard and it says, Dearest darling grandson, I'm writing to you from the deck of a splendid old cruise ship. I'm sailing round and round the world. Please don't worry about me. I will see you again one day. I promise. I miss you. I love you. Slobbery kisses, Grammy. There's another postcard. And this one says, my darling grandson, Alfred, just a little postcard to tell you all is well. Would you believe I'm all the way up Mount Everest? It's quite a hike, but I can see for miles and miles and miles. It is wondrous. I want you to know that even though I'm far from you, you are always in my heart. I miss you more than ever. Kisses and cuddles, Grammy. It was only when Alfred grew older that he suspected his mother had written the postcards itself. When he asked whether they would ever set foot outside Buckingham Palace, the Queen would take her son on an imaginary flight around the world. Oh, hold my hand, dear, and together let's fly up, 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 into the air, across London, across the sea, over the pyramids of Egypt, down the Grand Canyon of America, along the Great Wall of China, and back to dear old Blighty in time for tea. In his mind, the boy would see everything his mother described. The adventures gave him hope that one day they'd be able to leave the palace. Just then, Alfred felt something, or someone, slam down on his shoulders. He took a sharp intake of breath, but he was so shocked that no sound came out of his mouth. Two large gloved hands were holding on to him. Alfred turned around. It was another royal guard who had somehow crept up on the boy after he stumbled on the rug. Silently, just like the others, he picked the prince up with ease and dragged him back to his bedroom. L let me go, I said. L let me g g go. Alfred was powerless to resist. In moments, he was deposited back into his bedroom and the door shut behind him. He lingered behind the door and listened outside. The guard was waiting for a while before the founder's footstep betrayed his movements. In his head, Alfred counted to a hundred. As much as he wanted to race through the numbers, he knew that it would, it, would, it would be a foolish idea. He needed to count until he thought the close would be clear. 97, 98, 99, 100. He opened his bedroom door slowly and silently. Then he peeped out to check if, to see if anybody was around. The corridor was clear, so he tiptoed down it before hurrying down a long sweeping staircase and across the grand ballroom. This room once played a host to the most 
the world's most extravagant parties. Now it was a ghost room. The chandelier was hanging off by a thread. The silk curtains drooped on the floor and damp had blotted the walls with dark, ugly patches. Desperately out of breath, the sickly boy stumbled again, but this time he fell flat on his face. Ow! Alfred noticed there was some kind of powder on his hands. At first, he thought it was dust. The palace was encrusted with the stuff, but it wasn't dust. This had some sort of smell to it that was different. Chalk. Scrambling to his feet, he noticed that there were faint chalk martins all, uh, markings all across the vast floor. It was as if the boy was standing in the centre of a life-size chessboard. Someone had tried to rub the lines and markings off, and traces, but traces were left behind. Alfred bent down. There were words and symbols, but despite his love of books, he couldn't recognise any of them. What's more, there were burn marks on the wood and a large discoloured area with something heavy had been moved. So this is what Alfred has just described. Alfred shivered as he realised something. There were strange goings on in this palace. The boy stood up and walked slap bang into someone. Or rather, not someone, but something. The Octobutt. A robot programmed to do all his butler's duties. It was meant to make life easier, but it actually made it harder, much harder. It looked not only like an octopus, if an octopus were made of metal and trundled across the ground. Crucially though, it did have eight arms, each one with a special attachment for performing different tasks, hence the name Octo for Octobut, um, Octopus and Butt for Butler. Although his name made it sound more like it was an octopus bottom, the octopus had the following attachment arms. So I'll show you this. I've also put this picture on Hub Files under the book's pictures. Good morning, Mr. President, jabbed the octopus. But he was always getting things wrong. Oh, he hello, octopus whispered Alfred. I wasn't expecting to bump into you. Please, can you keep your voice down? Roast chicken, replied the robot, before announcing, you will be pleased to know I have boiled, washed your underpants. With that, the octopus flung a gigantic pair of unwashed men's underpants at the prince. They must have belonged to someone, hu some humongous old man. Whoosh, they landed slap bang in the boy's face. Thank you, Octobat, whispered Alfred as he removed a s the still sinky underpants from his nose. Now, are you ready for your game of croquet? No, hissed the boy. The robot swung its croquet mallet arm so hard it bashed the wall. Bang! So hard that the arm itself came loose. It fell to the floor with a crash. With seven arms rather than eight, it was now not so much an Octobat as a September butt. Outside the ballroom, Alfred could hear the bootsteps of royal guards growing nearer. Stomp, stomp, stomp. The soldiers were just outside the tall wooden doors that led into the ballroom. Uh, you go that way, urged the boy, spinning the octopus, rooked round to face in the direction. The, the Pope needs his toenails clipping. Very good, princess, came the reply. With all his might, Alfred pushed the octopus so it trundled off in the direction of the doors. As the boy tiptoed out the ballroom, he looked back to see the octopus crash straight into the guards, knocking them to the floor and accidentally slapping one in the face with its corgi stroke in hand. Slap, slap, slap. The guard grabbed the arm to make the robot stop and then it came off in his hands. Oh no, exclaimed the robot. I will never stroke a corgi again. The poor October net was now down to six arms. This was the fortress within the fortress of Buckingham Palace. In a way, it was a panic room, like a giant safe. It had been installed in case of an attack or horror upon horror in case of the re revolutionaries ever managed to break into the palace itself. The walls of the throne room had been made of meter thick steel 
The only way in or out was through a huge metal door which opened only with a fingerprint recognition. Just two people had access to that room. The first was the boy's father, the king. The second was the king's chief advisor, the Lord Protector. The Lord Protector was an elegant figure in his 60s. He was well-spoken and refined, with impeccable manners. A learned man, he spoke with great authority on any subject you might care to mention. Art, leisure, philosophy, he wore a black shirt buttoned up to the top with a tie and a smart grey suit. On his lapel, he sported a gold pin badge, which, like the flag, had an armband the Royal Guards wore. The Lord Protector had worked at Buckingham Palace for as long as anyone could remember. He'd started off in the Palace Library, tending to thousands of ancient books. Most of the books are displayed on shelves, but there was a handful kept lock under a key cabinet. Only the Lord Protector had the key. Like museum pieces, Alfred was not allowed to take these books up to his room. However, he could look at the covers. One intrigued him the most. It was an ancient red leather bound book with gold lettering on the front. The, new, the boy knew very little Latin, but he knew enough to translate that libro was a word you often found in the books, in library books. It meant book. So this was the book of Albion. Once, he, once when he'd slipped into the library and noticed, Alfred had seen the law protector studying it. Glancing over the man's shoulders, he saw there were hand-painted pictures inside, but before he could make out what they were, the Lord Protector had slammed the book shut and locked it back in the case. Of course, this was intrigued the boy more. Over the years, the Lord Protector had gained the trust of the king to the extent that he had become his closest advisor. As the country slid into ruin of crops failing with no clean water to drink, the Lord Protector introduced extreme measures in the King's name. Food and water were rationed, there were curfews at night so people couldn't go outside, punishments were severe including execution, the government was outlawed, the army and police force were disbanded and replaced by the Royal Guard. And lastly, the Union Jack was replaced by the flag of the Griffin. Since the catastrophic events that had plunged the kingdom into darkness, the king had relied heavily on the Lord Protector to guide him through his terrifying new world. Over the years, the king became more and more withdrawn, as if he disappeared into the back of his mind. No one knew exact why exactly, but the king, who had once been so full of life, seemed as if they were he were one of the walking dead. Soon he was ruler only in his name, the country controlled by the Lord Protector. When Alfred spied on his mother, being held by the royal guards outside a huge metal door of the throne, he seized his chance. The lady was making a lot of noise and struggling to get away, which distracted the two soldiers. This is no way to treat your queen. Unhand me. Do you hear me? Unhand me at once. A boy tiptoed behind them. And when the metal door slid open, whoosh, he took a deep breath and sneaked in. Right, that was the end of chapter three. Hope you enjoyed that, guys. Um, chapter four is called A Lost Soul. I'm excited to read this for you tomorrow morning. Um, we have a few lovely activities and tasks for you to do today, so take a look at the home learning plan. Any problems, please give me an email. Hope you're all okay. See you tomorrow. Bye.